Welcome to my Ransom Notes, the NOAA podcast. I'm Evening Ransom. Today I'm going to share with you what a real live official clinical diagnosis looks like. I'm going to read right from the, the diagnosis that I received uh, several many years ago uh, with all the diagnosis on it so, that I can, so you can kind of get a feel for what, what one might read like and what one might look like. And then I wanted to just touch on quick real briefly that I had run across this this woman who was talking about these personality disorders and basically all of us that have these channels and the, the, the discussions that we have and and saying that it was really unkind of us to be calling people toxic uh, it really kind of irritated me because I thought to myself that of how, how damaging that would be if I was to come, if I if I had say I had gone to her, say he had brought he had brought me to her, what a runaround it would have been, and to get me absolutely nowhere, and that how dangerous that is. But it was it was really interesting that that someone who who was you know familiar with with um, my channel and various channels like mine would have that observation that would be her opinion but she you know she's a therapist and actually sees clients and and so this is the kind of thing that she this this is the position that she has and and several people do I mean a lot of people do give advice about how to work things out with your narcissistic husband or whatever and uh, and to not look at them as as toxic and hopeless and all of that and so it's it is it, as much as we we can get this sort of false sense of security because we talk about it so much and we have an understanding, but really still the, the vast majority of the world doesn't. Uh, the, you know, the main population still doesn't grasp that there is a significant portion of the population, which I would have to insist is a higher percentage than we're saying, than we're told that it is. I can only guess that, that, that the percentages that are so incredibly low come from people who actually get these clinical diagnoses, which, as we know, are very, very few. You know, it's a real rarity that to, for, to, to actually have a clinical diagnosis, which is why I want to share it with you, so that you can, you know, get a feel for what, what, one, what one looks like and how one reads. But um, anyway, so I just, you know, wanted, so, so let's just jump into that. We'll start talking about the diagnosis. But to be aware of that, that it, it's still not everyone out there that agrees, that understands how, how really harmful these, these people are and how not amenable to treatment they are. Now, you'll see it right here in the diagnosis. You will see that this very astute therapist says that it is not that it, it, what, his, what his recommendations are, and they are not in line with someone who says that it's not a toxic relationship. They are, very, they are very much saying that we need to have no contact between us and, you know, that kind of stuff. So you'll be really surprised at, at how clear he is and how in line with the things that we say, you know, that I, that I say on, on my channel about it. It's right in line with all that. Of course, remember, I didn't listen to any of this at the time. I didn't accept anything that he was saying. I didn't even listen to it, really. I was like, oh, I, as soon as he started going down that road, I was like, he doesn't understand. He just doesn't understand. And then there was still one other therapist, same thing. It, we, you know, Because after, after this, we left. He took me to somebody else because he was still trying to get something on me. Two sessions in, or when actually one session in because she already knew him, she called me at home and told me, to close the door on the relationship and never look back. And I hung up the phone thinking, she just doesn't understand him. And I'm sure, I'm sure that when she hung up the phone too, she thought, that poor woman, she's not going to listen to me. Because I'm sure that it didn't sound like I was. Mm, my goodness. Anyway, all right, so let's jump into it. So he was in counseling with her from 8802 to 2603. His diagnosis is antisocial personality disorder, 301.7 as well as Situational Adjustment Disorder and Mixed Anxiety and Depressed Mood, 309.28. Yeah, so there that is. 
I share my conclusions with them, and I describe that I do not believe the prognosis is good at this time. My advice is that she focus on her children and healing from trauma. I advise that R offer her an equitable, uh, equitable settlement and a low conflict dissolution. It's clear to me that she has formed the parental bond with the children. It is an appropriate mother-child bond and central to the children's functioning. The children should remain with her. I do not find that R would be prepared to adequately parent the couple's two children. Contact between them who should be minimal and addictive re until addictive reactions have lessened. Could be months or even years. Could be necessary to maintain very limited contact indefinitely. There's, there's three reports total here. This is the very first one. The very first one, the one that I'm talking about in that story where he hands it to me, that one's right here. And so, yeah, that one has, um, that one has, okay, so it says, in addition to conditions diagnosed at St. Peter Hospital, I also find that evening has disorders resulting from trauma. In addition to post-traumatic stress and surviving a near-death experience, I believe that she has mood disorders from dealing with severe pain and lack of support. 293.83, 300.8, 307.89, and 309.01. Then he goes on to talk about how I should try doing EMDR. She should continue taking her medications prescribed. I uh, I do find her use of medications to be thoughtful and well-advised. In addition to medication, alternative techniques should be implemented as long-term therapy for managing pain management and depression. She needs to reduce level of stress. Marital issues need resolution, and she needs to feel supported as she learns to accommodate her disabilities. Yeah, that never happened. This is, she has inoperable injuries resulting from in chronic pain. Previously diagnosed heart condition has been advised to reduce the level of stress. So anyways, it's um, a really incredibly, really good comprehensive report, which I did nothing with. I pulled it out later, uh, like years later. So okay, so this was it written in 02. And then I continued on with him for another year. And so I have another report written a year later. I believe that maybe it was a couple more years because I have another report, a third report written a couple years later in 05. So yeah, so I have one 02, 03, and 05 for the same guy. But it tells a little story, that's for sure. And the diagnosis, and he, and he confirms in the diagnosis in 05, he confirms that he believes that his original diagnosis was correct, that he, he feels even more, more convinced that his diagnosis was correct. What does that mean? Well, the criteria for... Antisocial personality disorder is the disregard for and violation of others' rights since about the age of 15, as indicated by one of the seven sub-features. Failure to obey laws and norms by engaging in behavior which results in criminal arrest or would warrant criminal arrest. So, for instance, he might not think that, you know, the fact that he was forging all these documents and didn't get arrested doesn't make it any less of a crime. So the fact that he's not been arrested, which was actually what he tried to say in court was that, you know, never been arrested. Well, that doesn't mean the fact that you were doing crimes and just never got arrested. Maybe just makes you even that much more of a sociopath, makes you that much sneakier. Lying, deception, and manipulation for profit or for amusement. Impulsive behavior, irritability, and aggression manifested as frequently assaults of others or engages in fights. Blatantly disregards safety of self and others a pattern of irresponsibility, and a lack of remorse for actions. Other diagnostic criteria are the person is at least 18 years of age. They had a conduct disorder present in their history when they were younger. The antisocial behavior does not occur in the context of schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. While an adolescent may display antisocial features prior to the age of 18, this is they meet the criteria for what would be called a conduct disorder. Comorbidity. The DSM-5 indicates antisocial personality is comorbid with substance abuse disorder quite frequently and other personality disorders, narcissistic personality disorder. I, I really want to be careful about the things that they, when they talk about people in the criminal justice system because it, the, the idea that you have to end up in jail, that a record of arrest is, in my experience, that is not that great of, a, of an indicator about who's going to be the problem. In fact, it really could give you just a huge false sense of security. And people like my ex-husband hide behind that. I've never heard really anybody else ever, to, ever, ever have an occasion to, to need to be saying that they've never been in jail. Like, that, that that's an argument for, for their character. You know what I mean? Like, if you're ever in that debate in the first place, there's something going on. 
Individuals with APD may have to be contained by the criminal justice system through some combination of incapacitation, incarceration, supervision, or monitoring. Um, APD have a difficult learning from mistakes. They're rigid in decision-making poor, and make poor decisions that are unresponsive to punishment. Antisocial personality disorder typically have strong impacts on most areas of functioning, according to the DSM-5. Persons with APD may face incarceration as a result of their criminal actions, premature death from violence or accidents, or loss of assets or property from reckless spending, or civil forfeiture of assets, divorce, separation, unemployment, financial dependency, and state relief sources, homelessness, anxiety, depression, and suicide rates are all elevated individuals' with antisocial personality disorder when compared to the general population. <laughs> I wonder how they compare. They compare it to their their victims. There, no, that's where you would really see the elevated rates. Antisocials have the potential to cause great harm to those around them, including family, associates, neighbors, and complete strangers, through financial exploitation, theft, emotional abuse, assault, sexual assault, and homicide. I, I definitely feel like when you have multiple people in your life, which a lot of us do, you can kind of see. That there are differences. I mean, the really distinct differences. Like, which, if I, I specifically talk about the differences between my family and my ex-husband. The differences there, in my mind, are what I would say are the differences between someone, people with narcissistic personality disorder and people with antisocial personality disorder. In that the uh, narcissists, narcissistic personality disorder people, wouldn't spend the kind of energy thinking about others that my ex-husband did. My ex-husband was very focused on understanding others, on figuring out what people liked, what people wanted, what people, how he could ingratiate himself to them, how he could, how he could manipulate them, how he could, I mean, he was very, very manipulative. Whereas my family was just, were just very self-absorbed and it made them so vulnerable because they saw his narcissism. They had almost a, an affection for it. Like, in a lot of narcissists do. Narcissists seem to like narcissists, has been my experience. They, they like them, and then also, they also can tend to hate them, too. I mean, they, they get to get this kind of competitive things. You know, really, a sociopath really kind of pretty much hates everybody, but you'd never know it. But my, my ex-husband was way more charming. I mean, the way he was... He was able to play, mimic emotions and play at things and try to please people and win people over. Whereas my dad wouldn't even bother, he would never be bothered to do that. He is bulldozing his way through life and basically saying, you know, if you just super see how great I am, then that's your own loss. That's basically how my dad made his way through, through life. And, you know, so he was not super popular. He wasn't, he wasn't popular the same way, but my ex-husband was popular with everybody and not a loner at all. You gotta be careful with some of these things. This, like this is, a, they, and they might tend to be socially isolated, a little bit of a loner. And that's not the case. My ex-husband at all. He, one of the things that he, he was most offended by the diagnosis of antisocial personality disorder because he thought that it was saying that he was not popular, like antisocial, like a loner. And to him, that was like really a, a huge insult. He did not want to be called a, a loner. And so when he figured out that antisocial meant, you know, going against the, 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 the rules, the norms of society, that's what they meant with antisocial, not antisocial as in, I don't feel like socializing or, or nobody likes me, but antisocial in that I don't follow the rules of society. He was, he was, he was fine with the diagnosis after that. And he was totally fine with being called a narcissist. He had no problem with that at all. When I think of narcissist personality disorder, it really is just so much self-absorption. They're not thinking about other people in those terms. Whereas sociopaths really are thinking about victimizing people and about how they can manipulate others. And so what I see in my own story, my own situation, is if you want to see how it illust an illustration of how it plays out, is exactly that, is that he came into a situation. Here I had this situation with a lot of narcissists introduced into this narcissistic family, which was, you know, say that's a tinderbox, you know, and then he was the, he was the lit flame, you know, that would basically take all these people who had, they weren't, they weren't committing crimes, they weren't doing anything harmful to me or anything like that. They weren't doing anything like that. They just were not emotionally available and they were self-absorbed. It wasn't until they had someone, introduced someone to them who was going to manipulate 
their self-centeredness and their and their fears and their triggers then they would do bad things because they didn't have they didn't have the raw emotions they didn't have the love they didn't have a conscience to to not they were they were going to preserve themselves at all cost so that's that's what they were doing they weren't set out to destroy me in the beginning but when it came down to them just, uh, preserving themselves they were willing to to to, to get of whatever threat it was because it felt like they were fighting for their lives and i see that very clearly but they weren't going to come to that on their own they didn't have any they didn't have any reason to destroy me on their own and if i had gone into someone trying to tell me that I, that these were not toxic people and this was not a toxic situation that you know that would have set me back years you know that would have invalidated everything that i was going through so that's the kind of thing that I think is just really, really harmful. And that's one of the reasons I'm here is to say, hello, if you are around people like this or doing these kinds of things to you, absolutely you better call them a toxic person. And you don't, have, this is another thing she's, you know, about saying it to their face. Nobody's saying to say anything of this to their face. No one's saying you need to say anything to anybody's face. But you better tell it to yourself. You better let yourself know who they are and protect yourself, you know. It, it, you know, her point was about, you know, let's not cause conflicts, let's not hurt people, let's not call somebody toxic. Okay. You know, it was just, it was just seemed like such a naive, um, like this person who was talking just obviously had never been abused by someone who didn't, who had a personality disorder. That was for sure. But yeah, no one is saying that you need to call anyone a toxic person to their face. No one's saying that at all. But what it is saying is that you need to be really real about who's in your life and what's going on and the truth about your relationships or you're going to end up really damaged, as we all were.